Okay, good. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Dan Phillips, uh, Daniel Phillips. Uh, this is going to be a short talk about uh, WebAssembly and syscalls. Uh, quickly about me, I am an engineer and the WASM lead at Loophole Labs. We're a small seed stage startup. Uh, we do a lot of networking stuff and also some other uh, infra tools. Uh, we just released a thing called Scale Function Runtime. It's a uh, suite of tools for running functions uh, in a WebAssembly in environment. Uh, on the internet, I'm dfilla uh, and some variation thereof across different platforms. And I also uh, started and run the WASM Chicago group. So if you're ever in town, uh, feel free to stop by or uh, come join online. OK, so uh, we'll get right to it. Uh, uh, syscalls and WebAssembly um, is a problem for the Unix epoch. Epoch, epoch, um, I, like the word e I like the sound of epoch better. So I have an arbitrary bet that I'd like to start this talk with. Um, at least until this epoch ends, we will need to handle legacy programs that rely heavily on POSIX interfaces with system-specific function calls in WebAssembly, right? Um, this, uh, the epoch ends in 2038, right? The year 2038 problem. So I don't know, just arbitrarily, uh, I, I feel like we're going to need to handle POSIX and Unix-based programs in WebAssembly until then. So if, if we look at this code, uh, this is just a, a simple function that does, that makes three, but technically four, uh, syscalls, right? Uh, this is Rust, so we have open, write, read, and close. So if we run this in, uh, if we compile this to WASM32 unknown unknown, what will happen? Can we run it? Not, not really, right? Like, not out of the box. Um, but these are some very basic file system operations. So. What do we do about these system calls? There's one option. Uh, we can patch these with host functions, uh, we, which is how things like uh, the mscriptum VFS work, uh, things like Wasm Bindgen, um, these sort of things that call out to the host runtime. Uh, and then possibly on, in other places, those call out to the operating system itself. Uh, we can also ignore functions if they get compiled uh, to uh, this specific target. There's a second option. Uh, which is we can allow scoped access to the underlying host. That is WASI, right? WASI is the way to do this. Um, and at this juncture, I'd just like to say that uh, any WASI people in the room, just cover your ears for the next segment. And uh, everyone else, let's just keep this between us, right? Uh, we, we're all friends here. Um, I'm kidding, by the way. We love WASI. And actually, the whole point of this is to use uh, this exact thing with WASI components in the future. So third option, which I'm going to talk about today, is what if we provided a WASM component or layer that acts like the underlying system? That's kind of what we're going to explore. And this would mean something like a libc implementation and possibly usable system calls, even though they're not system calls in the traditional sense. So how do we identify system-related calls? Uh, this is a challenge with an arbitrary WebAssembly module, right? Um, there's not a ton of tooling out there for this, but uh, recently my colleague who's here, Jimmy Moore, worked on a, a uh, project at our company um, called Wasm Trace, uh, which allows you to, it's an, it's an S-Trace-like tool, which allows you to trace the specific calls made in, in any arbitrary Wasm module. Um, there's also some other interesting uh, uh, there's also some other interesting toolkits in there that do some other things with dwarf symbols, um, and I highly recommend you checking it out. So if you've ever used S-Trace, D-Trace, whatever, uh, you'll know that one of the things that it does for you is it, it can print out the, the system calls that are being made or will be made in a specific program, right? So um, if we have these syscalls, we can figure out what syscalls are being made what can we do with them then if we're going to think about a WASM first environment? Uh, there's a small project that we worked on um, called uh, Marcot WASM, which is a small CLI that adds system layers, a sort of virtual system layer, a virtual platform layer to an existing WASM application, right? Um, and uh, I'm just going to kind of go through this quickly and, and show you what it can do as long as I don't trespass on, uh, on, on my time. I'm going to do this by using uh, our scale function runtime, which is the code snippet that I showed before. So this is just a, uh, this is a QR code that goes to our landing page and tells you about it. It's also at scale.sh. So with that, do some demoing. Oops. 
I can type. Can everyone see that okay? Too small? Yeah? Yeah, okay, great. So this is a uh, marcotte, uh, which comes from French, which means layering. Uh, what this does is this will create uh, either the libc interfaces that you can then use in your WASM code, or if you pass in the full flag, it will also create the sort of underlying system functionality, right? The type of thing that uh, the kernel would take care of in a native platform, but this just builds it in a virtualized layer um, uh, right, right with this CLI, and then you can just consume that in your WebAssembly program. So if we try this. Pass in the full flag. Great. Okay. Oops. Okay, so here we have the code that created both the libc interfaces and the VFS for those specific calls. Okay. So what I'm going to do is copy this, take it over to my scale function here, which you can see this is the code that I showed before, right? We have open, uh, write, read, and close. There's there's no explicit close, but when the function when the Rust function um, uh, drops, then uh, close is is called, right? So what I'm going to do is instead of just I'm just for the sake of ease, I'm just going to paste this here. Okay, you'll see. So this is here. Um, really, really quickly uh, with the scale function, this is just all done with our CLI uh, in scale. Uh, what defines the dependencies are this thing called a scale file, very simple key values. Um, and you'll see here we need the WASM VFS, which is a small project that Marcotte relies on. And then also uh, these signatures, which are uh, what we use to communicate between the host and the guest. That's all uh, covered at scale.sh if you want to check that out. Cool. So we've got this now. And now I'm going to build. Fingers crossed to the demo gods. Great. Uh, the scale function runtime is written in Go, so it comes with a uh, fast HTTP server out of the box. So we can do, to run this locally, do scale function run, uh, VFS latest, lastest. Okay, so that's running at port 8080. And we'll do this. And there we go. We're interacting with a file system, right, in a serverless function, which uh, file systems aren't usually a thing in serverless functions. So there's, there's some interesting things that we can do with this, right? So here, right, open, write, read, and then close after the, after the function completes. So yeah. Last thing I'll say, just as a side note, we can also do this. Uh, as of this week, uh, so we have a global edge network that has um, that pushes this to places all over the world. It deploys on Scale Cloud, uh, which is available in less than 50 milliseconds uh, uh, anywhere on on Earth as of this morning. So you can check that out too at your convenience. Um, we'll also have some more info about that. So okay, so that's it for the demo. But where does this leave us, right? Uh, the future, right? So if we have these layers, what can we do with, with these virtual platform layers? Uh, we could do something like layering with diffs, kind of in the manner of uh, container images, right? How layering works and how you can use different dependencies. Instead of having to replace the whole thing, you could just use different system layers and layer them on top, pull them out, update them, whatever you need to do. Uh, virtualization layers for other system components, specifically those that must have host access, right? Like if we're in a WASM first world, uh, we still need an, a network at some point, probably. We still need things like block devices. Um, one of the ideas here is just like a VFS works in the Linux kernel, is that we could have a VFS sort of mapping over a WASI first component, right? Which then that component itself has the only scoped access. Every other component could just be WASM. Right? This might be an easier uh, institutional cell uh, to kind of like stay in line with WASM's sandboxing capabilities um, and just saying it's just this one component that can communicate with the actual host and it's scoped to this exact thing. It's just a thought. Could this lead towards a sort of true isomorphism, right? Uh, people who remember the early days of Node.js uh, thinking about isomorphic JavaScript. Um, this could also sort of blur the lines maybe in some interesting ways between the server and the client with WebAssembly running uh, with uh, virtual file system layers, virtual system layers um, in many places, not just the server and client, but um, IoT devices and many, many other situations. 
and with the component model, right? This is something that we're looking forward to. Parametric linking will make this much easier. Uh, resource and handle types will be a huge boon for this also. So when we're thinking about the VFS layer that we just created, that sidesteps uh, the context switching that happens uh, in from user space to kernel space, right? So with the component models, resource and handle types, this could actually make things faster than native for some of these uh, file system operations, which is kind of a theoretical possibility, but very, very interesting. Um, and then the tooling can evolve with new and emerging standards. We can sort of keep this going. Uh, we've kind of set this up so that as soon as uh, different runtimes have uh, support for the component model, we can swap these things out and get them up to speed uh, and make things even, even better. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the CNCF and the Bytecode Alliance, really, really incredible groups. The WASM CG and WASI subgroup for letting me be a fly on the wall to help understand some of these things better. And the organizers, it's, if you've ever organized something, it's so much more work than it seems. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. Again, I'm Dan Phillips, and uh, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, I think we might have time for one or two questions, if anyone has them. Uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Thanks. I'm Roman uh, from Cosmonic. Um, I have just a quick question. So you quickly showed that tool analyzing the WASM binary, right? Looking for syscalls. Yeah. Um, so my question was, so I briefly noticed you, there was WASI libc in there. So if I were to not rely on WASI libc, would it still be able to trace a syscall, or does it only trace things going through WASI libc? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the question was, if, any, if everyone heard it, do you need WASI libc to trace the syscalls? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, so, so like this, the trace program that Jimmy wrote. Um, Jimmy, by the way, if you could write, like wave, that's that's Jimmy, my colleague. Um, he also wrote Mibit. If anyone knows Mibit, the IRC cl um, a client. Uh, anyway, so uh, it traces everything, right? And so you can sort of pick out what you need. So if there, if it were, if WASI libc were compiled, it would trace that too. So it, but it doesn't rely on it. No. Yeah. Um, also, I'd be happy if anyone thinks of other questions. I'd be happy to take them in the Slack later too, or just talk to you. Anybody else? And speaking of organizers, Dan, you're prolific with what you do with Wasm Chicago. I know that you like all things WebAssembly. Come across um, you and your community, and thank you for all the hard work you do. I think we'll go and wrap it up here. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>